Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to this week's episode of How They Do That. I'm Mark Wallace. Well, on this week's episode, we have DC Chavez. He is a videographer and still photographer. He does all kinds of motorsports photography and video, as well as shooting people. He's based in Los Angeles, California, but we caught up with him in a hotel room in West Palm Beach, Florida. Welcome to the show, DC. Uh, thanks for having me, Mark. You bet. Well, let's start by talking about your videography. Um, one of the videos that's on your website that I really, really love is a drifting video in Brazil where you have this car going up a mountain. And you uh, tell us a little bit about what you did for that project. What kind of video did you use? Did you shoot this? Did you edit? What, you know, what was your involvement in that video? Uh, well, that Climate Tech uh, Brazil video you're referring to was something that my buddy uh, Reese Mellon, who's a Red Bull racing driver, um, and he also drives for Hyundai, um, he told me, hey, come to Brazil, we're going to do this great project with Red Bull, we're shutting down this side of this mountain, and I get to slide my car up it as fast as I can, going sideways at, you know, whatever speed, and I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. Um, I do a lot of video work with him, and so from there I was going to go down and just get additional footage to use in, in other video projects, but uh, once we started looking at the footage, um, we realized we got to do something with this, and so we ended up doing a full edit of it and created the video now that has over half a million views on it. Um, so that video it was shot, edited, cut, everything pretty much by me and only me. Um, Reese had some input in the, in the editing process, but for the most part I was a guy out there on the side of a mountain running up to 16 cameras at one time. Um, Red Bull Brazil had a whole crew down there doing their own thing and um, I was able to exchange for a little bit of footage, some of the helicopter footage you see, but everything else you see shot, edited, color corrected, delivered, social media, everything was 100% uh, uh, all me. Yeah, that video is pretty insane. In fact, we're gonna watch a short clip of it, and then I wanna talk a little bit more about the camera angle. So here's a really short clip of the video. <laughs> That is pretty awesome. So DC, tell us a little bit about how many cameras you used to make that video. Uh, to shoot that video, I actually had with me uh, two 5D Mark IIs, and I had an HVX 200, and then I had a whole battery of uh, Contour HD cameras, including their new Contour GPS camera. Um, the Contour HDs are these little POV cameras, really small, great little cams, and uh, we had those all over the car, all over the side of the road. Uh, strategically placed in the road so we get some run over shots and had those all over and I was just running um, running up the mountain to get those all going and at one point like I said we had I think 16 cameras going at one time. We, In fact we just shot uh, some footage using a Contour HD I threw it on my motorcycle and went up a mountain so we were really impressed with those little guys so how many uh, Contour HDs did you have on the, the cars themselves? We had cameras all over the place we had between five to seven cameras um, on the car at one time we had cameras lined up in each corner, um, you know, facing in, facing out. We had some cameras lined up um, as like a kill shot, like a runover shot, which, which you'll see when you watch the video. Um, we had cameras everywhere, and uh, <laughs> I had a two A5D Mark IIs locked off, one in each corner. I'm following along with the HVX 200. So, you know, contours running, 5Ds running, everything running all at once. It was just a lot of footage to go through towards the end, but I think it helped create a pretty intriguing little piece. <laughs> so you, that's awesome. I was wondering how you got that. So you didn't build any kind of protection at all. You just stuck those guys on the ground themselves. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct, Mark. Those cameras are sitting directly on the ground. And uh, I've worked with Reese a, a lot now over the past couple of years, and I kind of understand his driving style, but I understand racing, you know, and where he's going to come through the corner. And so through a careful uh, amount of deduction, I was able to just put the cameras down in a certain place and uh, kind of place and pray that he didn't run over them. So it all worked out in the end and we got some really um, intriguing footage via those Contour HDs. Well, we actually have one of the Contour HD cameras here in our studio just so people can see what it looks like. It's, uh, this is on one of the mounting brackets. Um, and these guys, you can see that they're, they're really, really small. So this, this Contour HD, you actually just put it on the ground and the car drove over the top 
of the camera. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, like I mentioned, it was sort of a place and pray, just that Reese didn't actually kill the camera. <laughs> place and pray, I got it. And then these actually have laser sights as well. Did you use those to line up how the cameras uh, you know, were, were positioned on the, the car and on the ground? Yeah, I actually do use the lasers on the Contour HDs. Uh, for people who've never used them before, they have these two little lasers that come out that help you align the shot. Um, you can actually spin the, the lens and the whole camera mechanism 90 degrees this way or 90 degrees that way. So it's it's nice to have the little lasers to kind of help you frame your shot because none of these POV cameras have an external monitoring option or even an onboard monitor. Um, it's better than anything else out there to at least have these lasers to make sure that you're one level and two, um, you know, you're getting what you want to get in the shot. So great cameras and I use them all the time. Yeah, I'll just turn one on. Here's a laser shot. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, these are pretty darn cool. So um, any tricks that you learned or any things that you would do differently with that shoot? Um, you know, always when you get into the edit bay, there's stuff you're like, oh, I wish I would have done this. But um, talk a little bit about some, maybe some of the lessons that you learned using that many cameras. Uh, what were the gotchas? Uh, the lesson I learned from this, from this shoot was to have help. If I would have known that we were going to create something that turned into what it did, I would have had definitely another system out there or someone else out with me. Um, but literally, I was sprinting all over the mountain to try and turn the cameras on, get the cameras on the car, turn them off once he got done, you know, get to the next location, back up data, do all this all at one time. So that's definitely something that was a, a definite uh, hindsight 2020 thing. I would have had someone else out there with me. Um, the other good thing that, that I learned from shoots like this is to always be sure to vigilantly back up your data. Um, when I was up at Pikes Peak, Colorado in June, and we had actually set a contour in the middle of the road, and a car coming by at like, you know, 120 miles an hour and ended up just running right over it and smashing the thing and spitting the memory card out along with it. And with the micro SD card, you know, it's a really tough chance of finding it. Uh, but thankfully, um, before that run, I had backed up all the data. And, you know, if I hadn't have backed up, pulled the, the memory, or the sorry, if I had not pulled the uh, data down off the card, there's a good chance that I could have missed, you know, 12 to 15 shots that we'd had from earlier in the day. And those are things you can't recreate in a, in a racing situation. You know, you have one chance to get the shot, and if it's gone, it's gone. So be vigilant about backing up your data because it could, that could be the one shot. If you get this shot, that, you know, could be something so unique that, you know, that, that one shot can make your career. Um, so be sure to back up your data. Well, that's a lot of your video work. You have a, a bunch of other videos on your website, dcchavez.com that you can take a look at. But let's talk a little bit about your still photography. You shoot cars and people. Let's focus a little bit about the stills on your cars to start with. Let's start with this shot of this Dodge Viper that you have in a studio. You also have another shot that's similar to that. It's a Porsche four-door, which I don't understand a four-door Porsche, but there it is, in a studio as well. Can you tell us how you lit those shots? Uh, for the shot of that Dodge Viper, I went down to South Bay Studios in Long Beach, and it's basically a facility that's built around shooting um, cars. They have like 14 stages there, the huge wide hallways to pull a car through directly and onto the stage. They have car prep there to get everything cleaned, if you need detailed, whatever you want. Um, and then they have massive stages. I believe the stage we shot that on was like 125 feet by 75 feet wide. Um, hanging from the overhead gantry, there's these huge, um, you know, flying flats, which we're talking, you know, 50 feet by 25 foot, huge white reflective boards that you can bounce light off of. And so for this, we backed the car into the cove. Um, I bounced some lights off of the back of, of the, the cyclorama to illuminate, you know, some of the uh, contours over the top of the car and then along the front and the back and then um, had this flying flat hanging over the top and you know, lit that from the top or from the sides as well to, to illuminate the top of the car and create a really nice horizon line across the front. Um, everything we shot with was all pro photo. Uh, I think we had an EQ2400 kit on there, a couple of those, and used those and fired away with those. Um, had another flat across the front to bounce more light off of to illuminate the front. Um, shot everything, um, got it done, one shot. That was one vehicle and we were able to pull a bunch of cars through that day and that was one of I think 16 cars we shot that day. So when you were shooting in that kind of complicated lighting, were you shooting tethered where you were art director or you know you're, you're uh, looking at a laptop or something to check those highlights? How did you do that to make sure you were getting the shot in the studio? Yeah, on that, that shoot I was shooting tethered, um, shooting from my 5D Mark II to a laptop and then that laptop and an external monitor. Um, we had client on set, so we had the monitor there to really show them what they were getting with each shot and make sure that they were happy and they signed off and everything before we moved on to the next one. Um, so we had someone there that was helping me out that would take all the raw files that were coming in, resize them, name them, um, do all the backup and everything, and then apply um, this profile we created for, for the raw files as they came in to get close to the look 
look of the final file we're going to deliver. Um, so it was super important on that one to be able to show your client what you were getting and make sure we had it there in studio so we wouldn't have to you know, go back or even after the fact uh, have the client say, well, we really wanted it to look like this because they signed off while we were there on set. There's another shot I'm really curious about, and it's of, it looks like a Hyundai that has its lights pointed right at the camera. It's on a racetrack. And the thing that caught my eye about that is I know by experience shooting motorcycles and cars that if you use the TTL metering with a car that has bright lights on it, it throws off the exposure altogether. So uh, how did you meter this shot and how do you normally meter when you're shooting outdoors and doing some uh, shots like this? Uh, as far as metering goes, I use the Seconic L358. Um, that's my number one light meter and it's got the, you know, the integrated pocket wizard receiver in there which is killer. Um, and use that as my main tool. Um, how I set up the shots is typically use that light meter to figure out you know how intense the sun is and then work backwards from there. Um, set a baseline and figure out if I want to use neutral density filters um, just you know to open up the aperture or if I want to use a graduated neutral density to balance out usually overblown um, sky and you know whatever I have as my main subject. Um, and then depending on the angle the light's coming at, whether I want to use polarizers to cut glare. Um, but a lot of those things are getting it right in camera so you don't have to try and fudge it later in Photoshop. Uh, but from there I typically use the sun as like a key light, position the vehicle in a way that the sun will, you know, maximize the, the most real estate in the car. And then from there I have a Profoto B2 kit that I travel with, or, um, and now I actually just got the B3, but the B2 kit to balance out um, the other part of the shadow side of the car to get a really even uh, illumination. And, and usually from those things, I get everything close um, shooting in RAW so that I can go back and, and, you know, and import everything in RAW and make any additional tweaks and recovery if I need to or you know, fit my exposure back and forth. Um, but yeah, RAW is super important and it's something that I, when I was starting out, I shot primarily in JPEG. And after a couple of missed shots, I realized I should be shooting in RAW. Um, and it's worth to spend the money on those extra extra memory cards to then be able to shoot and raw get the large file sizes but have as most flexibility, especially when you're doing it professionally. And that was something that I learned when I actually made the big jump from, from hobby to professional work, shoot and raw and back everything up. <laughs> well, like you, DC, I'm a, a big raw shooter. I love it for the flexibility in post-production. Well, there's another thing that we have in common that we both love, and that is pro photo light shaping equipment. So uh, I've seen that you're on the pro photo blog. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the pro photo stuff and the, some of the things that you're doing on the blog there? Yeah, I'm actually uh, one of the contributors of the pro photo blog. I'm doing an educational uh, series on light shaping tools uh, that Profoto manufactures. Um, anyone who's used Profoto gear before knows that they make a multitude of, um, of light shaping tools that can change every way that the light is cast on your subject. Um, when I first started photography, I didn't have any idea um, with you know what a magnum reflector did versus a soft light reflector versus an octa versus a hard box. It was all Greek to me. And so after a lot of trial and error and a lot of renting equipment and trying all these different things, I finally figured out what it was. And so upon meeting um, one of the guys from the Mac group, the US importer of Profoto, um, I spoke with them and said, hey, you got this great opportunity, this great blog platform. Why don't you use, why don't you use it to educate people on how to use your equipment? And so after a couple of conversations, um, we started something. And, and so from now, I'm on the Profoto blog writing these whole you know, scientific, really scientific studies of how these light shaping tools work, you know, putting a uh, light on, on her head on a um, stand, casting it against a bare white wall of a cyclorama, and then keeping everything else consistent, changing different light shaping tools and seeing how that affects the spread of light, how it affects your, um, your light output, and then showing people, you know, how soft or how hard the light is, taking those light shaping tools and applying them directly to a shoot with a model or with a car or something, just as a way of getting information out there of how these pieces work because I'm very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to hands-on see all this stuff and use it um, but the, the you know young aspiring photographer hasn't necessarily had the, the funds or the means to, to do all the trial and error work that I did so hopefully this blog can be an opportunity for people to learn to grow to ask questions and I'm back responding to questions people put on there um, and to see how this stuff works and understand why Profoto has a name that it does and why every rental house across the U.S. carries this stuff and why you can get it everywhere because it's a great product and, um, yeah, and why, why I use it in my daily workflow. Well, DC, you also have pictures of people and a bunch of videos on your website, dcchavez.com. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so we can't look at all that stuff, but people can go there to see more of your work. So thank you so much for being with us today on How They Do That. Thanks a lot for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it.
You bet. Now remember, if you want to see some of the stuff that DC talked about, you can go to the Profoto blog to see all of those light shaping tools. You can also go to the Adorama Learning Center to see some of the products that he talked about today in this episode of How They Do That. Well, thanks for joining me this week. Remember, if you have somebody that you'd like to see on How They Do That, send your suggestion to askmark at adorama.com and we just might have them on the show. Thanks again for joining me. I'll see you again next week. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.